What's up, independent insurance agents? Are you finally fed up with the massive amounts of time, money, resources being allocated to customer service within your agency? Is this causing your agency growth and revenue to become stagnant or even decline? The answer to this frustration is Glovebox, the premier mobile and web self-servicing solution made by successful independent insurance agents just like us, specifically for independent insurance agencies. Guys, this is the only platform with direct carrier connections. Glovebox gives your clients the power to engage within their writing carriers and you, their agency, in a single, easy-to-use platform. Mention the Insurance Guys podcast and get 20% off of your monthly subscription for life, guys, for life. This isn't an intro deal. This is for life. Schedule your demo with Glovebox today. Thanks. Insurance agents from around the world, welcome to the Insurance Guys podcast. My name is Scott Howell, your fearless host and leader, insurance agency owner and insurance evangelist for I Protect Insurance and Financial Services based out of Huntsville, Alabama. And before we get started on today's episode, please help me welcome, he is a six foot three sophomore from Sarah Land, Alabama, parade first team All-American rivals, five-star recruit. He is a fantastic insurance agent and a great American. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome the incomparable Mr. Bradley Flowers. How are you, Bradley? Great, Scott. How are you today? Best I've ever been. I have a first ballot entrepreneur hall of famer on the podcast today second one i've been actually third one i've interviewed i have been watching him as i always say like the discovery channel watches meerkats uh i have been studying everything he's done for the past four or five years guys we do not have much time with him today so i am not going to tell one of my incredibly stupid scott howell stories today i am going to jump right into it he is the co-founder of sports one marketing and formerly served as CEO at the renowned Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment Agency, which was the inspiration for the movie Jerry Maguire. His life's mission is to empower over one billion people to be happy. This simple yet powerful mission has led him on an incredible journey to provide one thing, and that is value. In all his content and communication, that is exactly what you will receive. He is a three-time international best-selling author, a top 100 business coach, and executive producer of Entrepreneur's number one digital business show, Elevator Pitch, and host of the top entrepreneur podcast, The Playbook. His newest book, Game Time Decision Making, was a number one release. He's been recognized by Variety Magazine as their Sports Humanitarian of the Year and awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my profound honor to introduce to you today first ballot entrepreneur Hall of Famer, Mr. Dave Meltzer. How are you, Dave? Uh, after that uh, introduction, I'm amazing, man. Can you uh, can I record that and put it on my alarm? That's amazing. Thank you so much. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull a Gary V on you and free of charge, just go everywhere that you go and do that for you as you walk into a room. As That's long awesome. as as long as I get to just soak up all the knowledge that you have. Is that the I first time you've ever heard that, Scott? <laughs> but yeah, well, yeah, that's the first time. No, no. Hey, Dave, I've got so much to talk to you about, and we don't have much time. So I have been listening and watching everything you've done for the past couple of days. There's a lot I want to discuss. I want to just jump into it. The first thing that you said that really resonated with me was you talked about just because they love you doesn't mean they give you great advice. And I've had this happen in my life. Can you talk just a little bit about what you mean by just because someone loves you doesn't mean they're going to give you great advice? Yeah, I think a lot of times we don't figure out our own what, right? We don't take inventory of our own values. What personally is interesting to us? What's experiential for, for us? What makes us feel good? What do we want to give to society? And most importantly, what do we want to receive? And so what happens is we go to all the people around us that love us the most. We call those people family and friends. And what family and friends want for us is stability, security, and ordinary. And they do it for our best interest because they don't want what? Us to hurt at all, especially right. our parents, our grandparents, our aunts and uncles. The last thing, if anyone's been a parent, you don't even want your kid to have a hangnail. You know, you're like, oh, no way. Well, so we have to understand that to say, wait a second, just because somebody loves me, they, that's not the advice that I'm going to want. I really realized it when I graduated law school. And my mom, who was a second grade teacher, 
worked two jobs actually. She filled up turnstiles at the 7-Eleven with greeting cards just so we could eat. But I went to her and I'm like, mom, should I be a lawyer or a salesman selling the internet? And my mom without blinking is like, dad, internet's a fad. You gotta be a real lawyer. And it clicked in my head, why am I asking my mom? She doesn't know anything about the internet. She doesn't know anything about business. I'm making a bad decision here. And then I started looking back at my life going, gosh, my mom had the best intention, but you know, I still tell her today, I go, she's giving me some really bad advice. <laughs> and so I think if everyone looks back and connects the dots backwards, they'll find their friends and family in the best interest and best intention of security, of painlessness, of resistancelessness, have given us really, really bad advice. So you gotta learn at a young age, vote for what you want. You know, take your parents' and family's advice like a handful of sand, say thank you, always be grateful that someone cares enough to give you the advice, but let it fall through your, your hand like a handful of sand. And every once in a while, they'll give you a kernel. For example, my mom's still my mentor when it comes to uh, being a parent. My, my mom raised six kids, all of them successful, all went to Harvard, Penn, Columbia, summa cum laude, all of them good, kind people. I, she's my mentor, right? Because she knows what she's talking about when it comes to raising kids, but right. she doesn't know anything about business. So I don't even go there anymore. I, I hey, equate Dave. a lot in business to, to the game of golf. And, and whenever you start playing golf, everybody and their brother wants to give you advice. And then it just gets jumbled up in your head and, and, it, and you get a worse outcome than what you're trying to achieve. And I had a buddy that I used to play golf with that used to say, I don't take swing advice from people that can't beat me. That's great. <laughs> that is true. And I also, golf is a great analogy for 30 minutes a day, you know, is worth more than six hours on a weekend. And I promise you, if I was playing golf and I practiced 30 minutes a day, seven days a week, I would be way better at the end of the year than playing six hours on the weekend because I've been playing six hours on the weekend for, you know, 40 years and I'm still shooting the same 83 I've always shot since I was 10. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Dave, Sometimes in the sports agency business, though, those six hours, I, I would imagine, are somewhat required. Yes, sir. You yeah. know it. Hey, hey, Dave, you know, our mission on this podcast is to help insurance agents in any way we can. We ask for nothing in return. We don't, you know, have any courses or crazy stuff like that. There's one thing I wanted to talk about today, and I want these agents to write this shit down. Something I learned from you yesterday I want you to talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about your five steps of selling. Yeah, so the five steps of selling is number one, uh, stimulating interest. And let me give you the best piece of advice as an insurance agent. Ask, right? Because everybody needs insurance. Everybody. Right. So if you don't write this question down, you're a fool. You just write this question down and you ask people in person, on the phone, via email, and media, radio, print, TV, social media. If you don't have this ask somewhere, I'm telling you, you're limiting your success. All you gotta do is ask, do you know anyone that can help me? Do you know anyone that can help me? I'm looking for some, right? And everybody does. When I was young, people only knew like the card game, the golf game, the church group, the men's group, the women's group. Today, on average, people know a thousand people and they're more than happy to help you. There are no gatekeepers out there. I know insurance agents, financial planners, and financial service people are always about how to get around the gatekeeper. I used to train people about that. Well, the first step is to stimulate interest, and by asking someone, what are you doing today? What do you like about it? What don't you like it? And do you know anyone that could help me? You will kill it. I still, today, look at my sent box in my emails to see how many times I'm asking people for help. Radical humility isn't just providing service and value, it's actually asking for help and making people feel good about them helping you because there's nothing that makes someone feel better than the ability to help you and become an investment of them. Now, second rule of insurance sales. In that stimulating interest, realize this, 80% of the people are not gonna answer your phone call, your email, your message. So don't try to sell on the message. 100% of the people will never buy on a message. What is the purpose of leaving a message? What is the purpose of your 80% of your business? Just to get them to call you back. Right. That's it. So if you're not practicing getting people to answer your emails, call you back from an answering machine or a text message, whatever it is, then you're not doing your job. You can beat people with math just by getting good at getting people to get back to you. You could be half the salesman, but get four times the people to get back to you, and you're twice the producer than the other guy half the salesman, 
But right, imagine right. if you put all the pieces together, you're getting more swings at bat because you know that 80% of the people, right, are not going to respond to you. So if you can learn to maximize that 80% of what you're trying to do, you're going to kill it. Then you practice what? Transitioning interest. If we can get a higher percentage of the 80% to you know, come over, plus the 20% that do get back to you, now you wanna transition that. And so you wanna have the best stories and lessons, right, that have the most value to what? Share a vision. So you use collateral material, you use certain statements, you use emails, whatever it is to transition them from that compelling, hey, I'm interested in calling you back, to I'm interested in what you're selling. Mm. And my best transition is whatever documentation or oral things that you do, it's all about learning. So I ask open-ended questions. Here's the, the framework which I gave you earlier. Everyone has insurance or knows someone that needs it. What are you doing today? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Mm -hmm. Keep going from broad to, to close and then say, would it help you if, you know, I bundled this and saved you a hundred bucks a month? Yeah, that would help me. Oh, terrific. Can you see any reason you won't want to move forward? When they say yes, that's a shared vision. Those are the first three steps. Stimulate interest, attack the 80%. Transition interest with open-ended, then closed-ended leading questions, and then share the vision with, can you see any reason you wouldn't want to move forward? Now, in the insurance business, you're 20% of the way done. This is the key to insurance sales, is you're not selling to anybody. You're not selling to anybody. You're selling through them. Because the real insurance people are managing and developing that vision that they stated to the point where every you created a salesperson out of Brad and Scott. Right. I sold through those guys. They love me so much. They're out there going, hey, who do you use you for insurance? Oh, I saw you got a new boat. You know who Scott and Brad are? Hey, do you, right? You got a plane. You got a, a house. Oh, you just bought a rental. You know who Scott and Brad are? That's selling through, not to. Right. And the way that you sell through people is step four, managing and developing a vision. The best way to manage and develop a vision is create a go, no go plan. Show people you've been there before. I remember my freshman year in college, I returned a kick uh, for a touchdown. And I did a flip into the end zone. And I flipped the ball to my coach. You know, I got the sideline. And he was so pissed. He looked at me and goes, could you at least pretend like you've been there before? Could you at least pretend that right. you've been there before? Well, managing and developing a vision, at least pretend like you've been there before. Manage and develop. Say, here's the first step. I'm going to have to ga gather data. It's a pain in your butt. Right, but I'm gonna help you do it, and it's gonna take us about you know 17 to 20 minutes, and we're gonna do it together. Does that sound fair? Next, right? And then after you go through all the steps, you give them a document that goes through that. So, in order, you know, the places that you lose the most business is on the front and the tail end, right? So, 80% of the business is lost because people don't know that 80% of the people don't give back to you, right? They don't realize that 80% of the time nobody answers. <laughs> So get good at that. Well, the other 80% of lost business is selling to people and just overselling, back end selling, manipulating, lying, cheating, or not managing and developing a vision so people aren't satisfied because there's some disconnect. When you tell them what you're going to do, you write down what you're going to do in a checklist and then go through the checklist as you do it, you're selling through them. They feel comfortable because why? Every step of the way, hey, you ask them, is everything okay? Yep. You feeling good about this? Yep. All right, let's go to the next step. Yep, yep. Can you see the reason we want to move forward? Yep. Can you see any reason that you won't want to you know do you know anyone else that I can help? Yep. <laughs> Let me give you five of my family members. Oh, my buddy just bought all this stuff. He didn't even know that there's an earthquake insurance, whatever. Yeah. Boom. You're now step five, thriving. Your business is thriving because people are out there, they're your eyes and ears. And now that everyone has at least a thousand people in their network you can't even handle the amount of business from when I was young. So insurance is a great place to be. You're helping people, we all know that. It has great value, great service. I even, on my investment side, they're all insurance-based investments, right? Guaranteed insurance based of annuities, IULs, all guaranteed. When the market crashed, I had so many of my clients call me, oh my God, I lost millions. Of and I was like, oh, I made 2%, damn, right? And then, yeah, when it was going crazy, I only made 60 or 70% of the upside. But the truth is, after taxes, I would have made that anyway. And two, I never can pick the top, right? I'm not that smart. If I was, I wouldn't be here. So anyway, do the five to thrive. Stimulate interest, transition interest, share vision, manage, develop a vision, and thrive. And I have a document. 
I will send to everyone. Make sure you post up there, david at dmelter.com or join my text community. They'll give you the number. Please, these documents, guides, exercises, even if you can't remember what I say because I talk fast and like a northerner, man, just use the document. Put your Alabama accent on there and you guys will be fine. Scott talks like a northerner too, so it's okay. <laughs> I, I want to talk. I know we don't have much time, five minutes to go here. So I'm going to uh, give you 10. I'm going to give you 10. I, as much as you'll give me, I will take. You're like my Mr. Miyagi. So <laughs> energy frequency. I started listening to the TED Talk. I ripped my shirt off and just started running around the house because I was so excited that somebody has actually, you know, talked about this on a TED Talk. Talk a little bit about energy, frequency. Uh, I heard you on one, uh, I think it was uh, maybe Gary Vaynerchuk, I don't remember, but uh, no vibrations and text messages. Hard to show yeah, your frequency through a text. I'm a, I'm a toughness and telephone person, right? Yeah. Because your voice has a vibration to it, it has a frequency. And here's the thing about vibration. Everything vibrates. The earth vibrates the slowest, plants, animals, humans, sound, sound, telephone sound, then light, then right. thought. But here's the interesting thing. The thing that vibrates the fastest, and we can't be aware of anything that vibrates, only be aware of that vibrate equal to or less than us. So we want to be as high as frequency, high vibration is the truth. Therefore, my whole definition of happiness, my whole mission is based off of vibration and frequency because I want everyone to enjoy the consistent every day, persistent without quit, pursuit of the truth, their truth, their potential. And if we're pursuing and increasing our vibration and frequency, we can have a stronger signal, a wider spectrum, meaning more people are gonna resonate with us and a clearer message, right? And I see this in my own career, more and more people, feel my message, they feel my frequency, it's reaching farther, different kinds of people, different spectrum, and my message is clearer. People are like, oh man, you know, you wrote my book. Oh man, why hasn't anybody explained it that way before? I get it, right? And so we wanna vibrate faster frequency. That's why I meditate in the morning for 20 minutes. I don't believe, I lived too much of my life with the myth of Sisyphus. I know a lot of insurance guys live this life. They feel like they're pushing a boulder to the top of the hill every day, and then they wake up in the morning, the boulder's at the bottom. Right. right. Same job, same thing. No, man, you got to plateau and grow. Elevate your frequency and vibration, plateau and grow. You wake up in the morning, you got a new high, a new personal best, a new frequency, and you use that as a baseline so that when things happen in your life, which they always will, you know, wait a second, I need to stop, drop, and roll. I got to get back to the higher place. I'm not going to allow myself to live this myth of Sisyphus. But once you also know this, Awareness is the key. And I'm doing a training this Friday called The Margins of Millionaires, When to Buy Low and, and Sell High. Well, that's how I got into to meditation because I do a vibrational frequency meditation called Theta Meditation. And the lady was trying to convince me to meditate. I told her I don't got time to meditate. Only people that are broke, high on their mom's couch, sick all the time, meditate. She said, oh, I can raise your awareness. Explain to me vibration. And I'm like, I'm still not interested. She said, oh, that's too bad because I could teach you how to when to buy or sell. Ding, ding, ding. I'm like, now there's something of quantitative value. I want to know when to buy or sell. I'm going to start meditating. And then a whole nother world of awareness and enlightenment came to play. So if you know your frequency, and this is where people talk about organic, authentic self. One thing you know about me from all my, my interviews is I am my own frequency. I had stopped living the life where I wanted to please everybody. I don't care. I would rather you hate me for who I am than love me for who I'm not. That was not true 15 years ago. I wanted everyone to love me. That doesn't work. That's not a frequency. This is my frequency. Either you get me or you don't, but I'm here to be of service and of value. And there's a whole bunch of people that get me and it's helping them change their lives. I was talking to my buddy Ragav with Tarmica, an insurance uh, vendor, and I was venting to him or asking his advice about a difficult business decision I was facing no matter which decision I made, I was going to piss somebody off on the other side. And he said something to me that I don't think I'll ever forget. He's like, dude, you can't be Switzerland. Yeah. You got to yeah. choose. My first interview, that's what they taught me. You cannot, no one wants to hear Switzerland on, on interview. <laughs> hey Dave, I've got an audience in here watching me podcast this podcast right now. For those of the, the guys that are in here right now that just shook their head violently when you said, feeling like you're rolling that boulder up a hill every day. The overall, what somebody can do to help find their frequency, to find their authentic self. Yeah. 
What are some things they can do? I got one. I'm going right to give everybody with the last five minutes, get your pens out, record this, go back and listen to this show. Cause th this is the basis of how I came to this. And it's what I call, I have paid the dummy tax. So imagine someone coming to your door and saying, Hey man, you don't have to pay federal taxes for the next 14 years. That's what I'm about to give you. So got number you. one, you got to take inventory of your values every day, personal experiential giving and receiving. Know that you can't give what you don't receive. So you got to focus in on receiving first so you can give, not giving to receive. That's a trade and negotiation. Every day, take inventory of your values and you're going to know what you want for the day. You're going to know what you want. Your why will come behind that. Once you know what you want, you'll say, why do I want it? Oh, yeah, to help my mom, help my community, whatever you're going to do. But people, they cheat themselves by talking about, I don't know my why. No, because you're a why me person and a why me person, not a try me person. Try me persons, they know their what and they apply the why to it. So mm -hmm. take inventory of values. And most important when you do that, don't be afraid to be a hypocrite. I'm going to tell you something right now. You don't know what you don't know. Everybody out there is pretending that they know the pieces of the whole. We don't know shit. So take inventory of our values. Realize you don't know what you don't know, which means it's okay to tell someone that you think differently tomorrow. Hey, I learned something. I grew. I accelerated. I used to think this when I was 18. Please don't judge me when I was 18. I'm 52. I don't believe the same things that I believe. All right, number two, and we talked about it earlier. I'm going to reiterate this. Ask, ask, ask. People don't have a problem asking how they can help people. That's easy. But I'm talking ask, do you know anyone that can help me? In person, on the phone, email, and media. Number three, pragmatic advice changed my life study your calendar. Now, what does study mean? Study is a mathematical equation to luck. What the hell does that mean? What you pay attention to, what you give intention to, mm -hmm. think, say, do, believe, and those unconscious competencies created by your character, your integrity, your obsessions, addictions, characteristics, etc. When you combine attention plus intention, you get the coincidences in life. So when I tell you to study the mathematical equation of luck, what do you want to study in your calendar? Number one, what you have planned. Number two, what you don't have planned, the empty space. And number three, your sleep, the number one habit that we all share. The only time that our subconscious and unconscious are not detrimented by our egos. We don't have interference or corrosion while we're sleeping. Mm. But most people don't get the most out of their sleep. Now, how do we study? With a lens, what I call the Meltzer Kaleidoscope, Sorry, a little bit of ego in there, but I spent years of dummy tax to pay for the kaleidoscope. I might as well name it after me. One lens is the lens of productivity, meaning how much value am I going to provide to others? How much service, especially in the insurance business, you should be focusing on activity you got paid for, activity you don't get paid for, but how you can be of service or value. And then the lens of accessibility, right? Everything already exists. So how am I going to access it and how accessible am I to others? How connected, without interference, resistance, how many sponsors and power sponsors do I have? Not gatekeepers. How many people out there either can help me themselves or know somebody that can help me? And then finally, most importantly, if anybody knows me, is the lens of gratitude. Nobody loves what they do. That's why you all rolled your eyes when I talked about the myth of Sisyphus. Nobody. I have represented the greatest celebrities, athletes, entertainers, guys that you know of, my business partner. And I will tell you this about all of those billionaires and millionaires that I hang out with. The same percentage of their life sucks the same as yours. Mm -hmm. The same exact percentage. Whatever percentage it is, it's the human nature percentage of suck. And the difference is they have a lens of gratitude. They find the light, the love, and the lessons in the suck. And you need to have that lens, and you need to learn to love everything you do. My mom and my wife are like, oh, you're just lucky. Every job you had, you loved. Who the hell would love selling legal research online in 1992? DOS computers, you know, DOS systems, XT computers, lugging, lugging a luggage cart with a computer on it all day long in Indiana. Oh, yeah, that's what I dreamed of, right? But I found the light, the love, and the lessons. And guess what? I was a millionaire nine months out of law school, and that made me feel really good because I bought a house for my mom, and, you know, a car for my mom and a house, and she's never even had one. Right. right? That made me feel good. So you find the light, the love and lessons. Number four, real easy. I'm not a big fan of statistics. I used to always tell people only statistic I've ever seen to be true is 99% of all statistics are made up. Then I started playing golf. I realized there's another statistic. 100% of all short putts don't go in. 
Guaranteed. Yeah. Well, here's the best statistic I've learned. 100% of the things you do now get done. The difference between successful people and other people is successful people get stuff done. So ask yourself, can I get it done now? And if so, do it. If not, put it in your calendar and study it for tomorrow, prioritized by what's most important according to your lenses and your inventory of values of what you want. It's simple. It's math. You will expand and accelerate and grow at such a rate, compounding the interest of success in your life instead of compounding the interest of detriment in your life. Now, finally, and this is where I'm going to conclude for you. The most important practice of the five is practicing ending fear. And it's a four-step process, right? Our, our biggest fear is fear. And our biggest detriment in life is fear. Fear causes interference, corrosion to the greatest source of light, love, and lessons that we're always connected to. And it also creates interference between everything else and everyone else that we're connected to. So number one, practice identifying what you're afraid of, right? For me, I wish I could take back, I told my wife on my anniversary yesterday, 23 years, I said, imagine if I could just take back all the time, money, energy, and resources that I wasted trying to be right. Mm. Just in our marriage. I said, I could buy you another beach house. All the money, time, and resources, I just would have taken that energy of trying to be right and just been successful, productive, accessible, and gracious about things. Or what about the need to be offended? Imagine my whole life or the need to be worried separate, inferior, superior, the need to be angry, frustrated, anxious, guilty, all the money, time, emotion I felt. What did feeling guilty ever do for anyone? It just gets in your way. So practice, number one, identifying when you have these ego-based consciousness. Two, learn to be a ferocious Buddha. What does that mean? Number two, when you feel angry, frustrated, anxious, all these things, stop. Because I'm going to tell you this, when you're in fear, any of those emotions, your mind, body, and soul are on fire. And everybody knows you catch on fire, stop, drop, and roll. So stop. Now, that is ferocious. You've ever been in an argument with your wife or your spouse, and in the middle of it, while you're traveling in the wrong trajectory at an accelerated rate, into, you know, I'm getting a divorce because you missed the exit. And I've been there. I am not perfect. I've been there like I had started with you missed the exit, and by the time I got home, it's like, why did I ever marry you? Like, where, where do we go with this? So not only it takes a ferocious being to stop, but you got to drop down and breathe like a Buddha. And then you can roll in the right trajectory, the one that you want to be in and start thinking that I'm so blessed to have such an extraordinary wife, right? Even if she missed the exit, I am blessed because <laughs> I have outkicked my coverage and only a fool would blow this over missing an exit. Sure. And yet I have months of wasted energy, time and emotion because I had the need to, you know, be right or offended or, or guilty or worried. I, I mean, worried, oh my gosh, in law school alone, I could have paid for law school three times over and got better grades if I would have just taken the energy of worry and put it into study, right? Hey, Dave, how many years of maturing, of finding your clarity, of finding uh, yourself and training, and to some degree, did it take you to get to a point to where when these things happened, you understood, I've got control of this. I can control this. I can control my anger, my ego, my this, my that. I don't have to let it, I don't have to turn this into something I think about for the next six days. How, how many years did it take you to come up with the, to, to figure that out? I haven't figured it out yet, but I'm on that journey. I'm farther along that journey. I started that journey though, of trying to figure it out. I started 14 years ago, right. two years, two years into the journey. I lost everything over a hundred million dollars. Just being two years in the journey, it helped me learn. I'm going to leave everybody with this pain, right? Pain used to be a stop sign for me. Mm. Oh man, I made a mistake. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. I'm going to be ashamed. But through this process of the five daily uh, actions, habits that I've given you, what I learned about pain is it's not a stop sign. It's a turn signal. It's a turn signal. It's just an indicator that I have a better direction to go because I got a lesson to learn. Life is about lessons. The lessons are going to keep on coming until I learn them and they're going to result in pain, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, financial pain until I learn them. But I know one thing when pain is present and it's indicating, it's not indicating me to stop. It's indicating me to go in a different direction, a better direction, one that will make my life better. I have faith behind all of this. I have faith 
that no one's trying to hurt me or disconnect me. Everyone's trying to unify me. The universe is working in my favor and God in source or whatever you call it is working in my favor to give me what I want. So I better spend most of my time figuring out what do I want and what's in my way from what I want instead of figuring out this isn't what I want or this is what other people want for me and then being pissed off when I get it. Mm -hmm. That's the perfect place to close this podcast, guys. No what else to say besides that. Dave, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you being on here today. It means a lot to me. I could sit here for three hours and deep we'll do dive it again. He's not lying. We'll yeah. do it again. We'll do it I again would, if you want. I would, I would love to. Uh, guys, as I always say, rewards come from action, not discussion. Get your ass out from behind that desk today and go out into the big bad world and develop relationships. Find your frequency. Figure out what your why is. Figure out who you are as a person and go make money for your family, for your wife, for your husband, for your kid's college fund, and for your parents that are struggling today. Go make money for them. Write good business for the agencies that you represent and write good business for the companies that you represent. Bradley Flowers, I love you. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Dave. Dave Melt, hey Dave Melt, sir, I love you too, brother. I love you guys as well. Be kind to your future self. Do good deeds. Join me every Friday for free training if you want any help. David at dmeltzer.com. Thank you both. Let's do this again. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Okay. Guys, you are listening to the Insurance Guys podcast, and we'll see you back here real soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Insurance Guys podcast. If you need to know more about me or you need to get in touch with Scott, you can always reach me at theinsuranceguyonline.com or email me at scott at iprotectinsurance.com. And if you need to get in touch with Mr. Bradley Flowers, go to portalinsurance.com or email him at bradley at portalinsurance.com. Guys, we love you. We thank you so much for listening to our show and being a part of our family. And we look forward to seeing you again next week on the next episode of the Insurance Guys podcast. Take care.